Hi everyone, this is Derek Watson, architect for MuleSoft Solutions for Microsoft. In this video, I'm going to introduce the .NET Connector version 2.0, which brings some exciting new capabilities for .NET developers using the AnyPoint platform to build integration applications. As a quick refresher, the .NET Connector enables .NET developers to use familiar languages and tools to extend the capabilities of integration applications on the AnyPoint platform. So you can use Visual Studio uh, and any CLR language to write code for complex transformation, message enrichment, to apply business rules, or perform custom message routing logic. And you can reference or reuse existing code, including third-party assemblies, even if you can't modify the code, and of course build new libraries of custom code specifically for your application. In terms of what's new in the .NET Connector version 2.0, we have a number of exciting new capabilities for .NET developers. Connection Strategies provides a simple and flexible way to reference a .NET assembly that you want to integrate into your Mule project, whether that's an assembly on disk that you'll manage the deployment of out of band, or an assembly coming from the global assembly cache, or if you want to package your assembly with the Mule project itself so that it propagates as you move the application from environment to environment. We also now have full data sense support in the .NET Connector, a very frequently requested feature. So that lets you get deep visibility into the types and methods that are available for invocation from your Mule flows. So you don't need to leave the Studio IDE to figure out how you're going to integrate with your .NET uh, assembly. And we extend that capability to the data types consumed and returned by your .NET code too, so you can use Data Mapper to visually map the structure of your messages directly into the properties of .NET objects. We also give you the ability to modify not just the payload from within .NET, you can now inspect and set message envelope properties so you can carry additional context into and out of .NET functions. And finally, to help with debugging and performance insight, it's now possible to log messages directly to the AnyPoint Studio console or ESP server logs directly from .NET and to tap into the Mule ESB event system so that you can instrument the calls into your .NET code. Okay, uh, let's now jump to a demo uh, to look at how this works. So in this demo, I'm going to show you uh, the experience of using the .NET connector in a Mule project. And for this demonstration, I have an existing c -sharp project here which models a simple company directory. This is just an in-memory repository so you'll see here I've got a number of people which I'm provisioning into uh, a dictionary and on my company directory class I have a number of methods that I can use to uh, perform searches and add or update uh, people and remove people from my directory. And in addition to my C -sharp, uh, assembly I also have a mule project in AnyPoint Studio here in which I've created three flows which model these same operations that I now want to invoke. So I've got three HTTP endpoints here with a different path for each operation. So you can see search, we're going to hit the search URL for upsert which is add and update in one operation, we will hit upsert and we have a remove operation here as well. So the first operation I'm going to liven up with uh, my connection to .NET code is the search operation. And to do that, I'm going to go to the Studio Palette, uh, find the .NET Connector, and if you don't see the .NET Connector in your palette, you can just simply install it from the Help and Install New Software option uh, to get that into Studio. Once it's there though, just drop it onto the canvas, uh, and we can now create a global element uh, for our connector configuration, which will hold the information about our assembly reference. I just click the plus button here, and the first dialog we see asks us to choose a connection strategy, which in the case of the .NET connector defines how the assembly will be found. In this case, I'm going to choose external assembly, which will let me reference a .NET DLL uh, by browsing the file system, and then I can manage the path to that assembly via a property at runtime so that I can, I can vary that location by environment if necessary. Other options here are including a reference to an assembly in the global assembly cache. In that case, you're going to provide a fully qualified assembly name, or you can select a project resource 
where you uh, incorporate that assembly into your project so that it will uh, transition with the application from environment to, to environment. So we select external assembly uh, and are presented with another configuration dialog here which lets me uh, control some of the options uh, around how the .NET code is going to be invoked. So using the scope property I can control the instantiation uh, model that's used to invoke my .NET code. In this case I'm going to choose Singleton uh, because I know I'm not keeping any state in my classes but if you do have classes that you need a new instance for every call you can just select transient and uh, a new object instance will be created for every invocation. You also have an option here to uh, grant the assembly full trust or limit it to a minimal trust sandbox and that can be useful if you're running a third party assembly and don't know exactly what the code does. In this case, this is my code, I know it's safe, so I'm going to grant full trust. We can also control from here how much metadata that DataSense will pull from uh, my assembly. In most cases, you'll only want declared types so that you don't see all the methods of base types of your classes, uh, but it's an option to expose everything if you need it. And finally, I'm going to browse for my actual assembly, which I will find under .NET samples bin debug and there's my DLL. Okay so we've got everything we need now uh, to start making this call into .NET. So the first thing I'm going to do now is select the execute operation on the .NET connector and now I have an option to choose a method name uh, that I want to reference. I'm going to choose search in this case and if I save the project there now, you'll see that there's some information over on the right hand side about the uh, expected input type for my, uh, for my search operation. And you see here that it's got the same parameter names as the method signature inside of the .NET code. So I'm going to name this operation search and I will also, I want to map uh, the arguments from a query string into this method here. So I'm going to uh, use the message inbound properties and I'm going to directly grab the HTTP query params and pass that in directly. And that will map the uh, query string dictionary directly into my search operation. So let's start the application in Studio and make sure that that launches correctly. Okay, so that's successfully deployed. For testing purposes, I'm going to use a Chrome browser extension called Postman. This tool makes it really simple to craft HTTP requests and see responses, which is how we're going to interact with this very simple API. And I've got some saved uh, queries over here uh, in Postman. So I'm going to execute a search now against my company directory uh, for name of nothing and department IT so I can see who's in the IT department. Great, I get two responses there and if I change this parameter here to marketing, you see I've done that before, hit send again, now we see there's another person there. And finally if I remove all of the parameters, let's see what we get. Great, we get the entire directory. Okay, so that's working well. Now let's look at the uh, remove person uh, scenario. I'm going to jump back into Studio and this time uh, I will drop the .NET connector into the remove operation. I'll select the previously created global element there uh, for our assembly and execute. This time I'm going to execute the remove person operation. And once again I am going to uh, map in the message inbound properties HTTP query params and that's going to bring the query string parameters directly through into my uh, map here which remove person you'll see accepts uh, just a single string ID. Okay so 
make sure that that has been successfully saved and reloaded by Studio. Okay, the application is running again. Uh, so if I now jump back to uh, Postman and uh, try re the remove person operation, I can execute that and you'll see that I get back uh, an answer here with the number zero, which is the number of people that were removed, which is actually pretty reasonable because I didn't supply an ID. But what you'll notice if I jump back to the studio console here is that I have this interesting debug message that's come from the .NET demo application that says I cannot delete unless the allow delete session property is set. So even if I had supplied an ID, it wouldn't do anything because I hadn't provided the right context. And if I look into my .NET code, you'll see here that for my remove method, I've got some conditional logic that prevents a person being removed unless there's a session property that actually uh, defines that allow delete uh, property that we saw on the console. So in addition to mapping the payload into the arguments of my method call, we're also able to access the properties of the message, which provides some very powerful side channel logic control. And here you'll see the source of that debug message uh, that was written directly into the AnyPoint Studio console from my .NET code, which makes it very easy to debug uh, in the event that you need to get some uh, internal state information out of your .NET code. Okay, so to, re to actually remove a person, I'm going to have to add a, uh, a little bit more information here as I make that call into .NET. So I'm going to put a property transformer in my flow uh, and I'm going to set the scope of that to session and I'll add the allow delete value, set that to true. Okay. Make sure that that runs. Okay, the application has been redeployed. And now if I go back to Postman, uh, I'm going to execute a, a get all operation against the directory there. Go and find someone to remove here. And I'm going to remove uh, John Doe developer. So I'll grab that ID and execute that request. All right, this time I get a one. So we've passed through the uh, alternate path in the code there now that we've set that property and we no longer have a message being dropped out to the studio console and if we just confirm uh, if I do a get all here yes in fact there are only three people in that in memory directory okay one more scenario I'll show you here uh, around remove person uh, is how the uh, .NET assemblies are dynamically loaded at runtime so that you can hot deploy a new assembly without restarting Mule or uh, having your Mule application restart. So in this case here, uh, instead of returning a zero, if I execute a remove uh, operation and there are no people with the matching ID, I've decided I'm going to change my logic uh, and instead return a minus one. So if there are no people, let's return minus one. Otherwise, we'll return one to say we did delete someone. Okay, so a simple change. Uh, I've saved that code. Now I'm going to rebuild. Okay, the build succeeded. And now all we should have to do without restarting Mule, uh, doing anything else, just hit send. And you'll see here that we've got that new functionality. So that's great if you want a non-disruptive update uh, to your assembly and re very helpful uh, during development time. Okay, so the final uh, scenario that I'll look at is adding a person or the upsert operation. For this I'm going to want to post some JSON uh, in to my operation uh, and then have that map into my .NET method call for upsert, which will update or insert depending upon whether the person already exists. So I will once again drop my .NET connector into my flow here and again uh, reference my existing global element and execute this time the upsert person operation. And I'm going to leave payload this time as the uh, arguments reference because I'm going to use data mapper uh, to map into the complex uh, structure of this object here which you'll see upsert person expects a person object which then has a number of properties including 
this nested address uh, data type here. So a complex structure, perfect for using data mapper. So in this case now I'm going to drag data mapper onto my canvas uh, and I have a, a JSON file that I'm going to use as a sample schema. This is just J JSON data, it's not actually JSON schema, um, but it's much easier loading this from a file uh, rather than doing everything by hand. And I am going to map that to upsert person and create that mapping. If we have a look here, there's a couple of properties that weren't auto-mapped. We're just going to wire those up. Since we're flattening the uh, structure on the input side, uh, you know, in the browser, it's just easier to see all as one level. Uh, but the object is a, a complex structure on the .NET side. We'll save that now, uh, and we should be good to run. Okay, so everything's wired up there now. I'm going to uh, start my application. Uh, but instead of this time going straight into Postman and sending that request in, I'm going to drop back into my uh, .NET assembly here uh, in my code, and I'm going to put a breakpoint in uh, where I want the debugger to stop so that we can see how this person object is getting mapped in by data mapper. So to do that, I'm going to uh, go to the debug menu and attach to the mule application process, which is identified here as java.w.exe attached to that and now I can go back uh, into Postman and this time you'll see I'm going to use a post request uh, with the same sample JSON data that I used as a schema for my data mapper. So it's using the same object uh, in this particular case. And if I now hit send to fire that request into my Mule application we should see Visual Studio stop on the breakpoint that we set. And since this is a full debug context, uh, I can inspect the person object here uh, and see that all the properties have been mapped through from my mule flow, including the properties of the nested class for address information here. So if I continue running uh, my Visual Studio application, uh, we'll now see the new ID returned uh, by the add operation. And if I execute a get all, then we can see that Mary Coder has been added to our directory. Okay, so that wraps this demo. In this video, we've looked at some of the new capabilities of the .NET connector, including how to reference an assembly from your Mule project, how to map both simple and complex messages into .NET methods, and some of the advanced capabilities around message context properties, and leveraging the logger to communicate with AnyPoint Studio. For more detailed documentation and code samples, of other scenarios that you can leverage the .NET connector for, you can refer to the .NET connector documentation on the MuleSoft website and in the Exchange. So if you have a scenario where you need to, uh, for example, leverage binary data types or want to map XML messages directly into your .NET assemblies, among other interesting possibilities, then you can check that information out too. I hope you've enjoyed this session. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time.